Hey, John. Welcome to WBXO. I'm Paul Toscano, and I'm here with my buddy, Pat Calamari, who's He's he's actually it's his show. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> right? Nice. It's the P and P time. I guess yeah. I don't know. A lot of P in here. See, I just moved in and took it over. That's all right. <laughs> well, hey Pat, how's it going? It's going good, John. Thanks for uh, joining us here on WBXO. We're classic rock redefined. Redefined meaning we love rock, we love blues, we love it all, and we can play it. My show is keeping new music alive on the radio airwaves, so we love your stuff. I was listening to sooner or later about an hour ago, and that's a really cool track. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's one of my, uh, I think that's one of my best I ever wrote. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward, John, uh, for the listeners, John, plus the Roadhouse Roosters presented in association with the Hudson Valley Blues Society on Wednesday, February 19th at 7 p.m. locally here at Daryl's House Club. I would encourage everybody to get your tickets. Call 845-289-0185 or go to DarylsHouseClub.com. And I'd recommend getting reserved seats. Yes, absolutely. Get a table and sit back. So, John, what I like to do is um, I like to just start from the beginning. Where, How did you uh, you know, know that music was uh, going to uh, get, get you involved? Was uh, your parents or family or anybody musically inclined? How did it all begin for you? Uh, I came from a family that, uh, loves great music. Uh, my mother, she loved, uh, she loved all the crooners and, uh, and she liked, uh, Lawrence Wilk. She'd watch Lawrence Wilk yeah. and, uh, and Hee Haw. Oh, yeah. And I, whatever. Whatever music show was on, she'd even watch night music, you know, and uh, she'd watch Saturday Night Live for the bands. And um, so she was really into it. And my dad was really into music. He loved uh, gypsy music, Hungarian gypsy music and uh, Hungarian folk music and classical music. And then um, my brother, he loved uh, he loved rock and roll. And hard rock and uh, outlaw country, yeah. and my and my sister, she loved all the disco and uh, Santana and Greece and you know all this all the stuff the girls in the seventies would like to listen to, and uh, so I got hit in every direction by all this great music, and uh, and my parents would take me out to see uh, shows. And, um, and, uh, I'd watch bands, uh, anytime I could, when bands would be playing at the park for free and, and, uh, and, uh, the radio, the radio was great. And, um, and I had uh, everybody's record collection, um, at my disposal and, uh, and a, uh, 100 watt per channel Marantz, uh, which sounded great. Oh, I bet yeah. your house was rocking. Oh, yeah, it was great, man. I'd come home from school before my dad got home, and I'd just blast that place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> until dad got home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One time he came. Oh, man, one time. One time. Oh, this. He, he, man. So, like, his music was the best music. And everybody's music in the house sucked. Yeah. And he, like... He would be listening to the most rock and gypsy music, right? Okay, but but American rock and roll, no, that wasn't that wasn't very cool. And uh, man, get this. Uh, one time, <laughs> this is a crazy story. One time, I came home from school, right, and he came home early, and uh, and uh, he got a, he came home from work early just to meet me, and he had all my records. And my brother's records and my sister's records in a uh, in a giant uh, uh, steel uh, like wash basin. Oh no! And he poured gasoline no. all over oh, it. Oh no! And dropped it in there, man. Was like, I was like, holy shit! Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But you know what I said to myself? Hell, I'll just buy more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy one with no scratches in them. Yeah, but man, you should have seen the black smoke. 
man. I mean, it that stuff burned forever. I could, I could imagine in the smell. <laughs> Well, no doubt. <laughs> so it was either it was either dad's music or that was it. Yeah, that was it. And so early on, I invested in a good set of headphones. <laughs> <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> man, no one's no one's going to keep me from the music, man. I was just uh, I, I I just loved it, and I had to have it. And um, and uh, whether people liked it or not. I was going to listen to it, and man, when I first heard the blues, man, that was the connection to everything I, that I, I see had a been note, listening to. I see a note here when uh, you really got connected when you were exposed to Buddy Guy and Junior Wells's Hoodoo Man, man Blues. blues. Yep. That's and right. it was home free after that. Is that pretty accurate to say? Absolutely, because, man, that music just, you know... The desire to, you know, be able to do what you want when you want to, you know, um, is so deep in that music and uh, the energy and the talent and the ability and the sound of the recording, the band. I mean, the rhythm section is, is so amazing, so funky and um, sophisticated. The bass, the bass is so sophisticated for blues at that time. I mean, this 1965, right? 65, 66? Yeah, so maybe 64, 65. I'm not know, exactly it's, sure. It's still Somewhere one of my favorite around. records. You know, I still try to cop his riffs. Oh, man. Yeah, like, he's he's one of the funkiest, grooviest uh, heart players ever to, ever to live, man. I mean, And then I, the way I, he could sing, it. too. You know, just put that together in that package with buddy guy backing him up on guitar and all this and like you yeah. said you know the whole rhythm he's section. my all-time he's my all-time favorite blues singer i could i could listen to him sing all day long me too me too he, I, I swear he was like the james brown of the blues oh he was so funky man he and was. always funky from the very beginning yep. man. yeah yep. he was a funky dude man yeah funk all over that guy man and uh, yeah, when I first when I heard "Snatch It Back and Hold It," that was it. I mean, he got me with and that chord. I mean, Buddy Guy, Buddy Guy just hits that chord, and then Junior comes in, with "Snatch It Back and Hold It," and and that was it. That was it, I, right? I was like, "That's cool," <laughs> <laughs> and it still is. It still is every time I hear it. So he, so Junior was the one who got you into playing harp. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he and he and Little Walter, um, uh, our bass player, um, was uh, he was working at a, a rental car um, place, and somebody had left a uh, somebody had left a uh, cassette tape in there, and he he pulled it out and listened to it. It said blues. And it had Mellow Down Easy on it. Oh, yeah. And that really hit me big time because um, I loved the cascading run um, that uh, Little Walter put in Mellow Down Easy. It's a really beautiful line. And uh, that line grabbed me. Um, much like uh, the harmonica in Snatch It Back and Hold It, where there's a great cascading line in it. And uh, there wasn't a lot of blues harp at that time that I heard that they that the player was using um, the upper register in that fashion that much. So it was very cutting edge at the time. So I really dug it, and, and I always remembered it. And when I saw the harmonica in the case, I thought, man, you know what? The harp sounds so cool. I want to, I want to sound like Junior Wells, and I want to sound like Little Walter. And, and I bought that harmonic and realized, wow, that's a lot of work to get there, man. <laughs> that's a tricky instrument. That it, harmonica is yeah. a kooky little rascal, man. It's not like a piano or guitar where you you know you push the note down, you know, you pluck the string and bend it, and it's 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 in there, you know. Some of the trying to get those bends out of the harmonic is strange, but uh, it's so expressive. I love it. It's the easiest instrument to learn and the hardest to master. 
<laughs> you got that record, man. <laughs> I mean, man, I've, I've been, you know, I've been playing on and off since 1973, and I still can't do any of the things I'd like to do. I, you know, it's it's one of those things. I I can get by pretty well, but I'm never going to be a master. I never realized until going to shows where the the, the harp player shows up with a suitcase and then opens it up, and depending on what note pulls out what harp he's going to play keys. and i'm going what yeah. is this about yep. and that was that caught my attention not you go to walmart and buy a harp that just not yeah it. you don't just buy a c harp and yeah. play on everything yeah no that's just yeah that's yeah what... i got a suitcase myself <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but it, it's, it's not too big it's not too big but yeah yeah you got to have extras you have to have spares of those things and you got to have your uh, you got to get your bullet mic and uh, and then you got every chord in there, and some guys some guys use like pedals and and effects units and things like that. And I just I never had that in the beginning, so I I, I don't use I don't use anything but my hands to create um, the unusual effects. That's cool. So there was a song that I was thinking. I have to look for this while um, Pat talks to you. But there was one song that I was listening to where it sounded like you were using an effect, but I'm sure it was you were doing with hand articulations. So while um, Pat talks to you, I'm going to look for this note that I made for myself because, you know, the old memory's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> so, John, let me... Hey, hold- Go Hold ahead. on a second. What 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 what'd you just say? A lady just came in to fix my uh, fix my TV. I'm just I'm trying to find a song that um, there was one that you did where you it sounded like you had were doing an effect, like you were using an effect, but I believe it was done through hand articulation. How, I know it is. It sounded like you were playing through a, a Leslie on "Come and Get It." Oh yeah, yeah. I I uh, I could uh, I, I wanted vibrato. But my amp didn't have it. Did, it had it, but it didn't work. And uh, the guitar player had vibrato. And uh, anyways, um, one day I got to the gig early and I plugged into his amp to see what that would sound like. Uh-huh. Um, and I just loved it. So I like kind of like uh, I got how I could use my hand instead of the effect. And so that's my hand. I'm actually just moving my hand in time so I, I i capture my own vibrato it's great man yeah you can do you can use so much with your hands like sonny bull williamson was really great at that that's true that's true so it's interesting so i i wasn't sure if that was a studio effect so now I, i'm i'm i know now i've confirmed it cool try it man try it yeah try different speeds of it and you can move it faster and slower you can make it very psychedelic it's fun <laughs> I have to try that because I try to stay away from using effects too. <laughs> yeah, it's just extra stuff. It is extra stuff, and there's always something goes wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, something will go wrong, and, and I don't know. For me, I uh, I don't like the sound of the of the effect um, with the breath that much. Okay. Um, but you know, like in, in the studio, you can use that stuff on as an outboard thing if if you want to, and you can put it on later. Right, right. Yeah, I've had I've had I've had engineers put some stuff on, um, like reverbs and things like that. Maybe an echo uh, to give some sort of like room simulation or something like that. Hell, I don't know. I just play the music. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what? I just I got a, a nice surprise recently, which um, is uh, great. The Love Light Orchestra. I hadn't heard that until recently, and that's like my new favorite record. Oh, I love that record too. Yeah, and we we just set up we just set up in a bar um, at uh, Bar DK DC in Memphis, and I'd done um, maybe like two or three shows there. Uh, with the band um i don't think we'd even done that many shows as a band actually before we recorded that and uh anyways there wasn't a whole lot of room in the place and so i would sit at the bar and sing wow uh, from from the bar that's and, cool. uh, that's different yeah so 
when I'm singing those songs, um, I had, I had girls all over. It was great. Um, <laughs> yeah, that sounds know. like that sounds like it must have been a tough gig. <laughs> <laughs> One of the greatest gigs of my life. I'll tell you. <laughs> but I, the, the production on that was spectacular. You know, the recording and all the details oh, yeah. in it. Matter of fact, I can even hear banter between band members in between the songs. Oh yeah, that's uh, that the engineers has got uh, Matt Ross Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kevin Houston, they engineered it. Um, Matt Ross Fang produced it, and uh, yeah, that that's that guy. He's done all sorts of uh, big time records. He's won so many Grammys, and and, uh, and he's one of the most sought after engineers uh, in Memphis and in Nashville. Um, so he did a fantastic job check him out check out his work uh, he's uh, he's done a lot of records i think you'll like i'll do that well this record have you gotten any awards for it because it's spectacular uh, you know um sadly live records really slip under the radar in the blues um which is strange to me because as a musician um that's where it's done we love we love the live records i mean the live records are that's 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 where it happens you know that's that's the that's the product in in test mode you know absolutely that's that's the stuff that drives you yeah and so um but i've released live records um and they just none of some of them have won awards but they haven't really done that great on airplay um um so that one, yeah, the live records just haven't done as as good um, on uh, airplay as the uh, as the studio records, um, and I think it's just because most of the DJs like to spin the uh, spin the studio records. And I love those too. Yeah, yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so that record really didn't get too far out there. Um, but to make everybody happy, we just cut um, a real serious record. Um, with the orchestra in Memphis at uh, the uh, a studio called Memphis Magnetic, and uh, this is a big room. It sounds great, and um, I could cut the vocals on the floor with the band. Oh, nice! Wow! And uh, it's all tape, all analog, and uh, it just sounds beautiful. And uh, I think it's going to blow your mind. I, I, I think it's fantastic. And the, the arrangements uh, by Mark Franklin are amazing. And he wrote um, a good share of the original material, as well as myself and Joe Restivo. And uh, very excited about it. And also cut a record with the Blue Dreamers. Oh, nice. That, that'll be coming out real soon. And uh, that's the group that... Uh, um, is on tour with me and these guys are hot you know to go and hear a band just after they cut a record is is really great because the band is really locked in and uh and uh on 110 percent how big is and the band on this this tour it's just it's just three band three band members oh, okay. uh, 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 on this tour um backing me up and it's uh john hay on guitar yeah and he, he's a, a Philly boy. And then um, Danny Banks on the drums. Oh, yeah, he's great. He's from Massachusetts. And Matthew Wilson um, on, on the bass. He's from Milwaukee. And, and uh, they all live down in Memphis. Well, Danny and Matthew do. John lives in Dallas now. Um, but anyways, yeah, and, uh, and uh, so... Everything's real fresh, and we cut the record with this group. So, and I haven't done it. I haven't done a scaled down record like that in a long time. And uh, kind of like the Hoodoo Man Blues record. Oh, you know, cool! It's, it's just harmonica, uh, guitar, bass, and drums, and it, and it sounds so fat. It's the same guy that uh, produced uh, Memphis Grease. Oh yeah, Scott Bomar. Yeah, yeah. I was I was checking that out too before because that was the other great record. That one I have on vinyl. When you yeah, uh, when you hear it in seventeen, sweet. I got that from you in, on vinyl. Yeah, 
yeah yeah that's 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 a bad record um and uh and and, and we recorded it that's an eight track one inch machine man and, and and the engineer he just he cut it you know uh and mixed it live on the fly um on the memphis grease record and and in this uh, in this new record we just cut so it's a real it's a real live performance and it sounds like you know those blues records of the '60s. Most of the gear that we cut on were uh, was actually um, from the '60s too. So, oh man, it, it, it has that sound. Yeah, yeah, an old MCI board and a Scully tape machine. Yeah, it sounds fat. Nick Curran yeah, used yeah. to record like that too. Oh yeah, yeah. I love man. I, I go back and listen to my records, and all the stuff I did on tape is my favorite listen. And. Uh, so Memphis is Memphis is one of those cities where uh, they were the masters of the tape, and they still are, and you can still go there and you can still cut incredible uh, tape records. You know, I mean that's one of the reasons why you moved there, right? Like was it back in thirteen? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you should yeah, tell people this story about you coming across the country. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I packed up. I packed up my wife and. And uh, and my daughter and and uh, and uh, flew them out to Memphis and then uh, I was going to drive the uh, the U-Haul truck. I got one of the big. I had to get the big one because uh, the the 26 footer or whatever. Because uh, uh, my wife had uh, 800 square feet of little girl clothes you know and and baby clothes because she knew she was going to have another girl <laughs> that's so funny um so we packed everything we had so much junk so much stuff packed it on this thing and uh down the road down the road uh, i i went and uh i could feel like the turbo was starting to go out on this uh, on this uh, truck because uh, it felt like it was gasping for air mm -hmm. and sometimes like the leak in the compensator rig or something and uh, sure enough man uh, Flagstaff Arizona uh, in January it's cold that's a cold <laughs> part of the world man and uh, it broke down and I unloaded that whole thing. They were supposed to send somebody out there to help me uh, unload this thing and load it onto another truck. But they were never coming. They were never coming. And it was getting dark. I unloaded that thing, and they got there when it was dark. And uh, and they uh, they loaded my stuff up, and they broke it and busted oh, it. Out. It was no. just. It was. It was just the blues, man. I tell you what, but I had my 1964 Fisher 800 C stereo, my baby, in the passenger seat in the front of the truck. So, no one was going to bust that thing. <laughs> the <laughs> wife and kid were in the back, but the <laughs> that's in the an front. old old tube rig, right? Oh yeah, man. I love I love lis I love listening to uh, music on tubes. Yep, I know. I just had an old tube receiver restored myself just for that reason. There's nothing like it. Oh yeah, real three dimensional. But man, that's a shame you had that breakdown. Oh, you know, and, yeah. and you're not even where you have to get to. Oh no! Oh, I know. And yeah, then, and a then long you, way to that's go. That's a lot, right? And man. then when you got there, you ended up get, you had to go right into the studio, didn't you? Yep. Yeah, I got there like uh, you know, I lost a whole day on it, and and I was so exhausted too. I was man, I was beat. But you know, sometimes you give your greatest performances when you're dog tired, and, uh, and I think that's what happened on that record. You know, I mean, I could have, I could have. Uh, I could have just, you know, canceled it and done it a week later or whatnot. But I've been on the road a long time in my life, and I've sang sick and I've sang tired, you know, and I've I've gotten through hell of tours, um, and uh, and came out grinning the whole time because you know you do this long enough and you you learn how to you learn how to do it. You know, and uh, and you 
you learn how to roll with the punches. And so your bag gets deep and, and you know where you can reach for the soul when you need it yeah. in certain places. And, uh, and I remember a lot of my most favorite uh, performances were actually when I was tired. So I was like, hell, you know what? Okay. You know, I've had some of my best when I was tired. So let's let's just go right in and do it. Well, so I didn't even mention to anybody, you know, that I was tired or anything like that. I just went in and knocked it out. Well, you knocked it out, John. Looking at these uh, notes here, Memphis, Greece in 2014 debuted at number four in a Billboard Blues charts. You, wow. won, you won the 2014 Blues Music Award in the Souls Music Male Artist category, and then wow. the album took prize, top prize for the Soul Blues album in 2015. So tired, awake, or whatever, yeah, you right. got it. You got it all going on, brother. Oh yeah, man. Hey, like, and I'll tell you, this last record was an interesting one that I just cut because I just like gone through like. Uh, crazy arthritis flare and I was in a wheelchair oh, no. walking with the cane and uh, just laid up, you know, and having to do gigs, having to go out and do tours. And, uh, and so, uh, man, I went in the studio was still with having this arthritis thing going, but I felt good about it. I wanted to hit it. I felt like I was in the right spot at the right time. And I thought the band was really, really super peaking at that moment. And uh, we went in and knocked it out, man. I love this new record. I, I'm excited for y'all to hear it. When uh, it And gonna... and I'm going to tell you, you might be able to hear a little taste of it. Well, I was just going to say. Coming up on some upcoming shows. I was going to say, you're going to yeah, throw a couple of good. new tracks out there at the uh, show at Daryl's coming up. on. Uh... I, might, I might surprise y'all. There I you go. That's what we like to hear. Well, uh -huh. We're going to have some fun when you come to Daniel's house. Oh, man. It's going to be a party. It is going to be a party. We're going to make sure there's a whole mess of people there. We want to get asses in seats and yes. just have that place packed, right? Busting out on a Wednesday night, baby. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. I'm with you, man. Let's look, all get in there and do it. Uh, last time you were there, you know, you had some new fans as a result. Yeah, man, I love picking up new fans. That's my favorite thing to do. Well, we're going to do everything we can to fill up those seats and those tables for you, John, here at uh, WBXO, that's for sure. And I tell all the uh, the folks that are going to hear our chat here right now uh, to get the tickets, uh, go to Daryl's 289-0185 or uh, the website, com. I'm just... You know, looking at all the notes, I got a million pieces of paper all over the place. You nominated in 2017 Blues Music Award in the category to B.B. King Entertainer of the Year. Your last album, Feeling Freaky. I love that name. It's great record. I mean, that, that is pretty good. I love oh, that. I love that title. That record's fun. That record, I mean, that, that kicked butt just like everything else that you have done. So you're on a oh, roll. Yeah. You are certainly on a roll since you uh, broke down in Arizona and finally got to... Uh, to Memphis, I'll say that. Oh, thanks a lot, man. I tell you what, I'm feeling good. You know, I'm feeling strong. I tell you what, I feel like I'm singing better than I've ever sung before. And, uh, yeah, man. And I think it's really important. I'm happy that you shared with us that you got this band, the Blue Dreamers, that helped record on the uh, the last album. I think that makes a big I'm not a musician, but that's got to make a big difference. And they got to feel the energy and the excitement to take it out of the studio and bring it on the stage. That's right. They have a vested interest in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Yep. Yep. They're in the driver's seat, man. It's And I'm just singing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's nice to see that you're, you're, you're healthy again, too. When I saw you a couple of weeks ago in Memphis, you look great. You're nice and, yeah, man. Nice I'm feeling fit. good then, too. Yep. Nice and fit and looking good. Sounded good when I saw you playing that day. So we're real excited about you coming up here. When, oh, man, I can't wait. When you put together the set list, John, so we're going to hear a little of, uh, a little bit of everything, come and get it, maybe a little uh, magic touch, and then certainly Memphis Grease and Feeling Freaky and maybe a track or two from your new uh, works going on. All the hits, all the hits, all night, and keeping it fresh, too. Tell me, when was the first time you heard one of your songs on the radio? Do you remember? Oh, man. That was a real long time ago. 
Yeah, it was actually, a, it was, uh, what was it? It was, uh, this is stuff you did with it was a song I was selling that we had a bourbon and blues night. Um, uh, it was Monday or Tuesday night um, at a club called Tom Graney's. And uh, I used to play there every Monday and every Tuesday. And the Jim Beam rep came in and uh, he loved my music and, and, and he thought I, and he saw that I was moving a lot of bourbon on my shows. And so <laughs> he brought in all his tasters. And so he would let everybody taste all the best um, Booker's and Baker's and Basil Hayden's and, Ooh. and, Knob Creek and all that. And that, back then, that was brand new stuff. That stuff was just hitting the market and, and it was blowing people's minds. And that guy asked me to do a commercial. And so I wrote a song, and man, it was writing a song for uh, Whiskey Night uh, that you can play on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> is the most difficult thing anybody could ever dream of. You can't tell anybody to, to drink the whiskey, taste the whiskey, look at the whiskey, hold the whiskey, smell the whiskey. You can't, I mean, you can say the name of the company, but you can't allude anything else to that would sound like you're trying to sell the whiskey to somebody. It was really wild. And, uh, and therefore, I can't remember the song. But I remember hearing. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember hearing it on the radio. They're driving down the road. I'm like, oh hell, I sing that. That's cool, you know. But um, yeah, so that was that was the first time. That was probably 1997 or something like that. And uh, so then I did a live record. And uh, my very first record was a live record. And. Uh, we cut that at this place called the Bouquet um, in Boise, the Blues Bouquet, actually, at that time. And uh, and that was great. Um, we kicked ass. I had this uh, bass player that used to play with Paul DeLay. Oh. And when, when Paul went to prison, he joined my band. And uh, I had this great uh, Swedish drummer. Um, boy, he and the bass player would get into some big fights, man. <laughs> wow. I mean, man, they just, they did it, man, did not hit it off at all. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, that was funny. A lot of funny, uh, funny incidences there. Uh, but anyways, uh, they were a great rhythm section. And my, and the guitar player that I started my band with, Tom Moore, he's the guy that really turned me on to the blues. He's the guy that, that gave me the Junior Wells Who Do Man Blues mm -hmm. record to listen to. And uh, he made a mixtape of, of uh, Blind Blake, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Blind Willie McTell, uh, Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters, uh, acoustic stuff. And, and he also had like B.B. King, Albert King, uh, Buddy Guy, uh, and... Uh, some Paul Butterfield on there. Ooh, Man, there it, was, you go. It, it was great. And James Cotton. And um, so, and this was when I was 14. And it was really by chance that his name was Moore and my last name was Namath. And we sat right next to each other uh, in, uh, in class. And we hit it off musically. So it's funny how fate takes you to different directions, you know, and who you meet along, in, you know, in, in your life and how, how certain people make big changes for you. And uh, yeah, Tom Moore, yeah, he was he was great, great guitar player. Still around, still doing it. Still in touch uh, with him? Still in touch with him, but uh, he's uh, he does attorney work now. Okay. You yeah. Got, you got a real, you got a regular job. <laughs> he got a re he got a re he got a regular job, yeah, yeah. And he did something that was really awesome. He helped change the drinking laws in Utah because Utah was very strict. You have to you had to buy a membership to a bar to drink there. Oh, that's I remember that. Yeah, I mean, I mean. well, yeah. If you're a tourist, good God, man, you know. I mean, wow, do I really have to buy a? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm gonna be here for a day. 
Um, and so he got all those laws changed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom Moore. I mean, uh-huh. even as a lawyer, you did something good. Well, I know one thing. Paul and I need to call Daryl's and make sure they're stocked up on the bourbon before you get there. Yeah, yeah we got to. got to make sure. Oh, man, well, I'll tell you what. I'm not even really drinking anymore. I, uh, I, I, I haven't really drank very much. I, I, I weaned myself off of it and... Uh, not for you, yeah, John. But, I'm talking about the audience. I mean, you got to get oh, the, the right. We got to get the right setting for it. you. The audience. <laughs> I ain't worried about you. I'm worried about. Oh, thank you. No, not you at all. I'm talking about when me and Paul get there. We're gonna have to have a little bourbon here and get get into the feel of your of your music. I mean, that's what everybody else does. So why not? That's right. No. Yes, right. Yeah. What? Well, I I did grow up with a still in the basement of my house. Hey, there you go. Oh man, those were the days. What ex- <laughs> hey, hey, John, before we let you go, I and mean, we thank you certainly for your time here. What excites you most about the uh, the blues uh, music scene these days? Uh, the originality, of the songwriting. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Very good. It's also. I nice. like. I, I like. I like where it's at. I. I think um, there's so many great artists that have been able to connect blues. Um. To the current moment, and so it feels very fresh, and uh, and exciting, and, and and in the moment, and uh, and it's 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 all over the place, and uh, you know. Great answer, I and, love that. And, and some of the young the cats too. Some of the younger yeah. cats coming up, you know, it's nice yeah. to see that. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you would get you get nervous, you know, that they're not that many young folks doing it. So, you know, when I was down the IBCs, it was just unbelievable how many young folks are, are playing the blues. Well, here's what I think about it. You know, the blues is meant to be passed down. And uh, I remember hearing a lot of stories about all these great blues artists, you know, Muddy Waters, you know, Junior Wells and different cats like that, you know, that would go out of their way if somebody asked them how they did something to show them how they did it. And... Um, because a lot of the a lot of the blues artists believe that uh, the music was supposed to be passed down, passed on, you know. And uh, if you if, if if you know the great blues artists aren't approachable, then uh, then the young folks will never have a chance to meet them or learn from them. That's true. And the beauty of the blues artists. Um, is that they are so approachable and you know you can go to chicago and you can go down to buddy guys legends and he's there a good share of the time and you can see him you can hang out with him you can talk with him um you probably even have a chance to see him get on stage and and sing a song with the band and that is amazing because buddy guy is one of the greatest you know, on an entire planet. Let me, let me ask you a question, John. Who was the w- one artist that you always hoped you met and did meet or, or didn't get to meet yet? Oh, uh, man. I'm sure you met Buddy Guy. I've met, yeah, you know. There's just, the list is just enormous, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's not just a one. <laughs> yeah, I was like, holy smokes, man. boom, you know. That's a whole, that's a whole, that, is, that is a whole flood, a whole flood of people in my mind right now. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I guess I'm just grateful that, uh, you know, um, all the ones I didn't get to meet, I, I was able to meet them through their music. And I feel like um, the blues singer is a very unique person and their voice is very much a, uh, like a fingerprint. And, uh, so much of their soul is, is, is in how they deliver the music. Oh, that's very true. And, uh, so you, you can get to know people, you know, you can get to know a singer, um, just by, uh, just by hearing the, hearing the records. And so I get to spend as much time with these folks as I possibly can. You know, I just 
put the record on and and because like out in idaho not a lot of blues was coming through um and so uh um and and if it did i might have i might have missed it mm-hmm. um and uh so i had the records that's what i that's what i started listening to was the records and just uh, before youtube so I had to get into the song and the feeling of the song and, and the direction of the delivery. And, and uh, it's great when you can, you know, just sit back. Oh, what happened? We just lost him. We lost him. Did I call him back? Oh, man. That's drag. Let's see where to go. What a wonderful day we're having. <laughs> what a wonderful day. <laughs> this must be a recording. What a wonderful day we're having. What a wonderful day. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Please leave a message after the tone, that and I'll get right killer. back to you. Thank you so much for calling. I look forward to talking to you. The mailbox is full and cannot accept any messages at this time. Uh, Goodbye. Snap. I guess I call us back. All right, folks. We got cut short on that, and uh, it's a real shame because he was a lively interview, Mr. John Nemeth. Um, he will be here on February 19th at Daryl's house, located on Route 22 in Pauling, New York. And uh, you can call in. Um, where do we have the number here? Uh, 845-289-0185. Oh, you got to commit it to memory, huh, Pat? Dude, at, at <laughs> DarylsHouseClub.com. That's right. Presented in association with the Hudson Valley Blues Society, me, and a whole bunch of other people. It's going to be Wednesday, February 9th at 7 p.m. With, with the Roadhouse Roosters opening up the set. So we really thank John Nemeth for taking the time out of his busy schedule to hang out with us on the phone and uh, share some stories. And Pat, thanks for having me along with oh, you on no, your show. Dude, that's great. This it's is great. Good fun. And, uh, well. Keeping the blues alive uh, here in the Hudson Valley. That's and doing right. our best here at WBXO. We are classic rock and we're redefined. That's right. And make sure you guys come down and say hi to Pat and I. We'll or, be there. 